Um, before uh, we go to, uh, to the panelists and I, I share with you the question which have been posed to, to the distinguished panelists, I want to take this opportunity to stress the uh, importance of, uh, of the diversity of the situation and the challenge that the panelists will have in coming with concrete solutions, taking into account this diversity, diversity of situation because vulnerability may be linked to uh, different type of uh, situation, geopolitical, environmental, economic shocks, can be due to protracted crises in countries of origin, it can be due, as we have seen this morning during the discussion on integration, to the lack of long-term integration and inclusion in the country of residence. Diversity, diversity in terms of areas of vulnerability, whereas uh, whether they are linked to uh, economic condition, social condition, or security. Diversity in terms of groups involved, whether we're talking about asylum seekers, refugee, whether we're talking about migrant workers, including, for example, ma uh, women, or if we're talking about children, uh, very, very different uh, groups and maybe policy responses. But also uh, diversity uh, because of the different stakeholders involved. And we had a lot of very interesting discussion this morning. I remind the presentation of uh, uh, Mrs. Marina del Corral, who emphasize the role of central and local authorities, social partners, so both trade unions and employers, not only employers, as well as other part of the civil society and migrants themselves. If we want to empower migrants, we need to think about their role in this process. So uh, we need uh, to, uh, to find uh, solutions to these uh, challenges that we have been discussing for the past two days concrete solution, and as a, a Colombian uh, 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 delegate uh, just before in the, past, in the previous panel mentioned, uh, we need to find innovative ways to address the issue, not old wine in new bottles, but we need to find new solutions. So with this uh, very short introduction, uh, setting a little bit uh, the scene for panelists, I want to remind the three questions which are asked to the panelists. What role do the various actors that you, you represent have in preventing and addressing migrant vulnerability? How can international cooperation and coordination efforts uh, to address migrant vulnerability and empower migrant be strengthened? And last, how can multilateral system foster discussion and consensus on the inclusion of this issue in the Global Compact for Migration? So as I said, we have a distinguished panel to uh, uh, address this question, starting with uh, Mr. Georges Jachy. Uh, since 2012, you are Executive Secretary of the Secretariat of the State Commission on Migration Issue at the Ministry of Justice in Georgia. Mr. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thanks to IOM for inviting us and uh, giving a possibility to express our viewpoints uh, with regard to this important uh, issue. Uh, since the very time when states uh, start managing migration, uh, the collective action has always been crucial in building relevant mechanisms, guaranteeing their sustained development and addressing challenges arising. The more complex as developed migration processes are, the stronger coordinated action is required. And that concerns all levels, from the deep national to the top global and vice versa. If this chain is weak at any link, it may cause damage to all system in spite of how effectively organized and managed the mechanisms are at both ends. Thus, the well-running coordination at the global level does not necessarily mean its perfect combination with national or international so-called sub-global level systems. On the other hand, the fragmented and discordant action at a local level is capable to harm the process on both national and global levels. There is a common consensus over the need for inclusive approaches to the migration management, especially when it comes to the migrants in vulnerable situations. As any other work in migration management, especially at a global basis, 
the protection and empowering of such migrants starts and entirely depends on a coordination-based approach of all actors. The call for better or even just a coordinated action, especially in this regard, is more frequently voiced out at practically all relevant international forums and is, among others, underlined in New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants and the report of Mr. Peter Sutherland. From the national viewpoint, which we'll review the case from, the above interaction does have 3D perspective, local, international, and global. All the dimensions are very much interdependent. The local platform, which has an influence on two following dimensions, is indeed complex, and in certain event and cases, much, very much depends on those it can influence on. The coordination among the Stroika nowadays does or should very much look like a process of a tunnel construction, where two teams are building the tunnel from the opposite sides towards the junction point defined with the help of the third team. The project is successful when at the end the tunnel joins at the place defined and agreed upon by all three. Given the multidisciplinary nature of modern migration, the number of actors, both at national and international levels, are increasing, and their role equally needs to be well coordinated. Well, above there, you're going to see uh, the one slide I prepared for. Uh, it represents this logo of my organization. The one slide is not because I'm lazy or just violating the rights of uh, my organization. It's because how we see the landscape of uh, coordination and its architecture. As practice evidences, the global coordination process depends on coordination at the national level, where the state must provide an umbrella uniting all relevant, including new players, in migration management, governmental structures, international organizations, civil society, academia, municipalities, ombudsmen, and naturally migrants who hold keys for the success of global initiatives and their translation for the people. To realize that, there is a need for a modern, strong, comprehensive, flexible, and effective mechanism capable to run the simultaneous, interlinked, and coordinated action of all relevant actors, but on both levels, on regional and the central levels, from the law enforcement agencies to those dealing with economics, social, labor, health, statistics, regional development, and other equally important fields. Our experience showed us that the best platform for that is a commission-type platform, and trusted to be the main board responsible for the elaboration, planning, coordination, and implementation of migration policy. It must bring together political level representatives of all state agencies involved in influencing on or linked with migration management. Its architecture must be designed in a way to cover exclusively all fields of migration at all levels, be most flexible for the modernization, and capable to adjust its immediate action on the basis of effective coordination among all actors. It has to be based on a simple but effective platform where the ideas deriving from collective thought are prevailing over the artificial barriers that could be created by non-coordinated action. To enhance its potential and avoid simultaneous or duplication work, where documents are more progressive than action, the platform should include the relevant international and non-governmental organizations. Thus, the main product provided by this body, the policy, will be the result of a strong synergy between the state agencies represented at the ministerial level, NGOs, international organizations, the third team helping us in defining a junction point of our tunnel, municipalities, the voice from the local level, migrants themselves, and academia, guaranteeing the preliminary and deep analysis of the action to be undertaken. Such a collective mechanism is capable to correctly and effectively assign the roles of different players, coordinate and increase the cooperation among all, including international partners, avoid overlaps, parallel action, duplications, and by that increase necessary resource mobilization, and finally ensure the sustainability of decision making. The decision making should be built upon, and in most cases it will be a push factor 
for the trustworthy high quality migration data highlighting the actual trends and patterns hidden. This in modern world can be achieved by the combination of already established policy tools such as migration profiles with the newer opportunities provided by big data technologies. Based on the above tools and product it provides other ways, it is possible to create a policy vision that can put forward the genuine needs of migrants and replicate picture and real abilities of the state. Such a system will quell multi or in our case miscommunication of different actors from local level with a global process, thus ensuring that the approach of the state is single and derives from a joint work of all represented on the ground. On the other hand, this type of action will involve and to some extent do something which sometimes might not occur outside of state, coordinate on the ground the work of relevant and national actors and their headquarters, thus shifting the motion to a second international dimension. The coordinated action of those two will have an immense effect. It will send a clear message as a reply on needs identified at a global level, a third dimension, and ensure that voices of all are properly replicated in GCM. This is something we've already gone through in Georgia and achieved the results. Through the Commission unifying 12 state, five civil society, and seven international organizations, we have created a new migration strategy for 2016-2020. It is the first strategic document and a guideline for the state which by considering other relevant strategies and using unified e-data collection system establishes the basis for the support to regular and fight with irregular migration. Development of international protection system in Georgia, strengthening integration and reintegration policies, mainstreaming migration and development, improvement of migration management, enhancement of international cooperation and rising of public awareness. However, this is a flip side of the coin, in our case, tunnel. To have a result, there is a need for the parallel and in some extent similar action on a global level to guarantee that GCM is based on a multilateral approaches oriented on improving migrants' rights and especially of those in vulnerable situations. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, Jashi. I think we, you, you made a clear case uh, for the need to improve, in, in, improve and uh, coordination in a context where the number of actors is uh, increasing, as you pointed uh, out to. You came with a very concrete solution with this uh, commission-type platform, which is not only interministerial but also multi-level, uh, with also some uh, representative of the NGO involved. Uh, civil society, migrants themselves, and academia. Obviously, that raised the question of uh, how you can make all these different actors work together, the, the budget question, the question of policy trade-off, of different time frame that these different actors may have. But I, I'm sure we'll come back to this, discussion, to this question during uh, the discussion. Let me turn now to Mr. Gibril Fall who is a founding and interim director of ADEP. Uh, ADEP is Africa-Europe Diaspora Development Platform, and I'm sure you'll tell us more about that. And you are also co-founder and director of GK Partner, a UK-based company that advises on socially responsible business model, social enterprises, legal structure, uh, responsible finance and business for development. Mr. Fall, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I will concentrate my presentation on the third question in the program, which is how can the multilateral system foster discussions and consensus on the inclusion of vulnerability in the global compact on migration? I have no intention to be boring, but I will be repeating things that may bore you. For the sake of clarity, I want to repeat what I think is a reasonable consensus as to what vulnerability is within the context of migration. That it is diminished capacity to resist, cope with, or recover from violence, exploitation, abuse, 
and or violations of human rights. And the implication of this definition is that vulnerability is not inherent to any class or group of migrants. It is about situations, not circumstances. So the key elements are situations and circumstances. So the situations that cause vulnerability in migration generally are the abuse, exploitations, and human rights violations we're talking about. And the circumstances are the inadequacy of individuals to deal with these situations by themselves. There is an exception to that rule, and we can use that exception perhaps to illustrate how multilateral discussions can help focus um, vulnerability issues in the compact. And that exception is children, because of their very nature of inherent lack of capacity to deal with this, they are almost always um, being able to be categorized as vulnerable. On that basis, we need to just check, and this is more an analytical exercise rather than a philosophical one, and check whether or what are the issues that are very prevalent in making migration, in creating migration vulnerabilities. Over the past two days, we've already heard some of them. We will not be surprised by any of them. We know them. The analytical exercise is to do a disciplined piece of work of identifying them and homing in in relation to the discussions with the compact. The examples we have are lack of access to health and legal services, um, xenophobic and racist harassment and violence, Another example would be wage fraud and financial exploitation. There are other examples, but we know what they are. These generally are areas where you can find vulnerability of um, the situations where you will find vulnerability of migrants. Now, what or how should we address this in the compact? I think it is now time considering we are in July of 2017, then the discussion of the content of the compact must be accompanied with the discussion about the format of the compact so that we home in on actualities rather than the broad speculations. The guide we've got is this, that the compact would have to be principles, actionable commitments, and understandings. At the Global Forum on Migration and Development in Berlin, we had the opportunity to discuss possible formats. And I have um, printed out a copy, a two-side, one-page document. It is on the desk um, um, by the door. You can have a look at that. And amongst the suggestions, I would use the suggestions of the format to refer to the specific areas of vulnerability, is that, of course, we do need to have a short vision and a reaffirmation of existing agreements. That should perhaps be a single statement, a single paragraph that just confirms and reaffirms everything we agreed, including the binding provisions. Now, when we come to principles, I think we should focus ourselves on new principles, genuinely new principles, or principles that need updating. And on that basis on vulnerability, I can give examples as to what I think we should be focusing on. Regularization, without any doubt, is one circumstance that tends to make migrants vulnerable. So maybe a principle a genuinely new principle on regularization should be something discussed with the intention of it being agreed in the compact. Where it, what you agree as member states, it's up to you. But I think as an area, it is some, a point of principle that needs to be discussed. Another principle that needs to be perhaps updated 
would be the idea of firewalls for the provision of essential services, health services, education, social care, and things like that. So that's the example of um, new or updated principles. Another example of principles is about not only the non-updated principles, not only about the non-criminalization of migrants, but the non-criminalization of migrant solidarity. Because we are beginning to see some organizations who support irregular migrants being indirectly um, perceived as committing criminal offenses. So the non-criminalization of solidarity may be a principle. So if we move from principles, that is focusing on new or on updated principles, then I think this is the moment, and I heard strongly some of the statements made yesterday and today that we have to focus on doing something practical and something new. And something new that I would suggest is for member state, states to commit to omit. That is to find a short list of things where they are making a commitment to omit, meaning this shall never be done. And taking children as an example, there can be a commit to omit that children will never be detained. And the difference between other commitments and this commit to omit is that it's a binary function. For some activities, there is a degree and a spectrum to which you achieve it. But a commit to omit is it's either on or off. It's binary. You detain children or you do not detain children. And that will be a short list, but I think it is important in the context of innovation, in the context of implementation, in the context of moving from where we are to try this psychological approach of commit to omit. Then when we come to the general commitments, I think this would be the long list. This would be the biggest part of the compact. It would be the long list of things that member states and their partners, civil society, business, would commit to do. And in that, on the issue of um, vulnerability, we can have a whole long list of things. For example, end to indentured type of employment, where your passport's being held or some forms of sponsorship. That's a commitment. Another area of commitment might be access to social security in descending country or countries of origin, whereby even you are working abroad, there should be a facility for you to be able to contribute to con country, um, country of origin. Other examples would be not to link terrorism and general heinous crimes to migration or migrants. It is true that you would have migrants who are criminals, but I can assure you our citizens are far more than able to cause havoc to our countries without the help of migrants. We prove it every day. And thirdly, I think another example of commitment in this area is the concept of transnationality. The world has become smaller in every possible form, yet it is in our nature as humans to think about the order, the outsider, and blame them. One of the practical ways of dealing with it is to come up with the principle of transnationality. When I talk about this, it's the time I said, this is a time we are almost missing the hippies and the 1960s. The world needs more loving, more loving and more loving. And lack of, we should not be ashamed of it, because the opposite is so prevalent that the concept of transnationality and the love of humankind should be repeated. And finally, when it comes to monitoring, my point about that in terms of format is it should be about monitoring and improvement so that the whole approach to monitoring is not to name and shame, but to make it easy for member states to say, in this area, I am not doing well. What can I learn from orders to improve? Because every member state is doing some things good, some things bad, and in few things, very ugly things are happening. So we need to change the monitoring approach so that it's about improvement. 
And Mr. Chair, I think that's all I had to say. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for uh, this uh, very inspiring speech. Let me turn to the third speaker, Mr. Marius uh, Olivier, uh, who is an extraordinary professor in the Faculty of Law, Northwest University, South Africa, but you're also teaching in the University of Western Australia, and you are director of the Institute for Social Law and Policy. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you so much for the, um, to the IM for the invitation to, to make a presentation here and for all the support given. This is all about the Global Compact, we are told. We heard from the Chair this afternoon that we should look at new solutions, at empowerment and the like. What I'm going to present to you on the topic of social protection for migrant workers abroad is the subtitle Addressing the Deficit via Country of Origin Unilateral Measures is an outcome of uh, two recent comprehensive studies I undertook for, on the one hand, the ILO and the African Union Commission, and on the other hand, for the ILO and ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, about the social protection status of migrant workers. It deals in particular and specifically with unilateral measures undertaken by countries of origin. The contents, as you can see in this slide, uh, and we won't have time to cover all. In fact, all that I actually will have time for is to read through a few slides uh, given our constraints. But a few words about the challenges faced by migrant workers abroad in relation to access to social protection as an introduction to the issue of the um, work done in this regard by, by countries of origin. Then secondly, developments concerning the extension of social protection to migrant workers by country of origin we won't have time for the historical approaches. We'll say a few words about international standards or perhaps the lack thereof. And thirdly, importantly, developing state practice. And finally, to the extent that we have time, some comments on conclusions and recommendations. So the first part then actually deals with the challenges themselves. And in this regard, next slide please, the, um, it is clear for anybody here, and I think for all of us who work in this area, that there is a lack of or weak social protection for migrant workers in several host countries. And there are several, many reasons for that. Um, in particular, what I would like to emphasize is that in certain regions, for example, in the Gulf countries, very limited provision is made for the extension of social protection to migrant workers. On the other hand, the social protection systems of host countries may not be adequately developed. And this is another reason why our migrant workers are often excluded. Bilateral social security agreements, often being seen as a golden standard, are still new to large parts of the developing world. Where they do exist, however, they often only cover a limited range of benefits, social security benefits, and only in relation to certain workers, categories of workers, in particular higher skilled workers. So we can see that the rank and file of the workers are excluded. Despite recent attempts to provide more extensive coverage of migrant workers than before, there is also a tendency which is quite prevalent, at least in ASEAN, to develop separate but inferior regimes or schemes, if you like, for the coverage of migrant workers, in particular unskilled and lower skilled migrant workers. These separate schemes provide pr protection which is less beneficial in comparison with that available to nationals and often also, at times, to higher skilled non-nationals. The second part deals with developments concerning the extension and I want to turn my attention to international standards. As far as countries of origin are concerned, so I'm not talking about um, uh, host countries, there is no binding international instrument or international standard in relation to what countries of origin could or should be doing to extend social protection to migrant workers. Yet, increasingly reference is made in soft law instruments, as we call it, and I've been able to find at least three. The one is the 2007 Cebu Declaration of ASEAN, which makes it clear that origin countries are encouraged to set up policies and procedures to protect their workers when abroad. Secondly, the 2006 ILO migration, multilateral framework on labor migration, with you know, several country practices. And finally, the 2008 UN uh, comment, general comment number 19 on the right to social security. Extended protection for national workers employed abroad 
is indeed in the making and is happening, as we even heard in the last session before lunch, Colombia and Mexico. Perhaps one of the most important notable developments in recent years, several migrant sending countries have introduced measures to provide some social security protection to their own workers abroad, invariably strengthened by an extensive raft of supporting measures. In fact, in ASEAN itself, no less than six of the ten ASEAN um, countries have done indeed this. And most of them, um, this is a recent phenomenon. The measures have included, and I'm just touching the basics, the establishment of special overseas welfare funds, workers' welfare funds, Philippines and Sri Lanka. Other measures have included voluntary and at times compulsory affiliation in national insur social insurance schemes or measures and schemes aimed at, aimed at supporting the flow of remittances and even the unilateral exportability by the country of origin of social security benefits. The extension has, amongst others, been achieved through very interesting legal mechanisms. Constitutions increasingly speak to this and statutory frameworks. Even in some provisions, bilateral treaties, as you can see on this slide. Next slide. These extension mechanisms are often supported by a range of complementary institutional, operational, and information sharing measures, which we don't have time to discuss. That brings me to conclusions and recommendations. I better say about it. In the first place, unilateral measures by countries of origin are of relatively recent origin, but seem to be growing in extent and in popularity. So it is indeed happening. They cover sizable numbers of migrant workers. In the case of the Philippines, 8 million, some would say 10, and in the case of Sri Lanka, 2 million. Yet they appear to be particularly problematic in the absence of appropriate and effective monitoring, enforcement, and persuasion mechanisms. There are other challenges too. Limitations of extraterritorial implementation. How do you implement extraterritorially what you want to do as a country of origin? Well, there are solutions. Think of the Philippines, online transactions, using embassies as vehicles, and even arranging with host country institutions, such as the Netherlands is doing um, worldwide. Also, contributions paid for this purpose are often too low to provide meaningful coverage and may place too much burden on the migrant workers. Innovative funding solutions are needed, including allowing channeling of remittances for this purpose. The benefit range, social security benefits, that range is often too unwieldy and goes beyond social security provision. Deportation, or repatriation, everything else that you can think of being covered, or more focused arrangement is needed to enhance social security coverage. Further challenges include that the fact that the social security systems of some of the very countries of origin themselves um, are still weakly developed, although we see large-scale improvements in Africa and, and also in ASEAN. Absence of a statutory mandate and a policy and program framework in some countries, these need to be developed. The lack of, in, of awareness of entitlements regarding the insurance which has been contracted for and also complex claim mechanisms. And these arrangements do not generally cover informal workers and undercover migrants. We do make two on the first of your contradictory points, but both are true. Unilateral agreement, oh, sorry, um, arrangements it should be, not agreements can never replace what should be the primary source of protection of migrant workers' social security rights, i.e. coverage under the laws of the host country. Unilateral measures remain measures of last resort. Yet, however, unilateral arrangements emanating from countries of origin provide interesting important avenues of coverage, protection and support. These arrangements and interventions can provide important forms of protection and may be easier to adopt than by and multilateral frameworks. Then, last slide, my final recommendations. It's my view, and based on the research that we have undertaken, there's considerable scope which exists for north-south and even south-south learning in this regard. Many sending countries, countries of origin, need the technical advice as to how to do this. Thirdly, it will be worthwhile to develop, in my view, a compendium of good practice examples that may be of considerable assistance. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, I would like to suggest that there is a need to develop a framework of international standards and guidelines, standards and guidelines, to inform and strengthen the use of unilateral measures by countries of origin.
think. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Olivier. I think uh, thank you for, for putting on the table this question of uh, social protection. This is obviously uh, extremely important uh, in that uh, discussion. Uh, you mentioned some uh, practical solutions, special obviously welfare fund, uh, these guidelines that you mentioned at the end of your presentation. Also, you put on thesis on uh, soft soft cooperation and exchange, uh, which I think is uh, very relevant in this context. Obviously, one other challenge is uh, here uh, to go beyond migrant workers and cover all migrants, including family migrants and, and other migrants, uh, but maybe one step at a time. Uh, so let's see, uh, we have question. I have on my list uh, the ambassador of a mission of a sovereign military order of Malta, first followed by Libya. And if other uh, would like to take the floor, please raise your flag. Uh, the Order of Malta would like to thank the organizers of this extremely interesting session. The Order of Malta will continue to address migrant vulnerability through its international diplomatic network on the multilateral level in Geneva, New York, Brussels, Rome, and Strasbourg, as well as through its bilateral ambassadors in 106 countries and its national associations and the field operations of Malteser International. We would like to engage with other stakeholders to maximize cooperation for the protection of migrants. The Order of Malta would finally like to stress the importance of the full respect of relevant rules of international, regional, and domestic law, as well as re universal religious values that promote the protection of human life and dignity and international solidarity. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Moderator. I want to grab this opportunity, actually, to share with you, uh, distinguished uh, professor, some ideas that none of the previous panelists would, would love to share it with me because I, I knew that most of the previous panelists, most of them were migrants. So I need someone who's very transparent and could guide me and could guide us all. Now, to start with, how to reduce vulnerability? I said from the very beginning, to reduce vulnerability is to legalize migration. If, if migration would, would not be legalized means it to be regular rather than irregular, then we'd not, we would not find a durable solution. Because we've been taught, we've been taught that we should respect human rights, democracy and the rule of law. And I believe if I'm a migrant and I wanted to uh, go to a country of a destination or a transit country illegally, it means I'm breaking the law and I'm breaking the rules that I should have been respected in the first place. Before I ask for someone to respect my rights, I have to respect other regulations. So, the second point, which is the last point, Mr. Professor, the, the theme that we heard the New York Declaration recommends for us is the title of the Global Compact. The title is the solution. The title is, and everybody knows, it's a global compact on safe, orderly, and regular migration. I understand, Professor, that means a migration which is unsafe is not welcomed. A migration which is irregular is not welcomed. This is how I understand the title of the, co of the compact. Uh, otherwise, please guide me, Mr. Professor. So I want to say, maybe it's the last time I would take the floor in this workshop, I would say that by the adoption of this global compact, there will be no place for irregular migration. There will be no place for unsafe migration. Thank you very much.
thank you. Uh, WHO followed by Myanmar and Guatemala. The International Maritime Organization is uh, the United Nations specialized agency based in London, responsible for safe, secure, and efficient shipping and the prevention of, of pollution from ships, including, of course, the safety of life at sea. As such, the organization is responsible for a range of international legal instruments, including the Safety of Life at Sea Convention and the Search and Rescue Convention, and also has a comprehensive guidance and information resources, some of which are of relevance to the unsafe movement of mixed migrants by sea. The 172 member states of the IAMO recognize that using the search and rescue system is ringed in the SOLAS and SAR conventions to respond to max, uh, mixed migration was neither foreseen nor intended. Using the search and rescue system and the diverting merchant ships is not a viable solution to the migrant crisis. Although governments and the mercant shipping industry will continue rescue operations, safe, legal, alternative pathways to migration must be develop developed, including safe, organized migration by sea, if necessary. As IMO represents probably the most international of industry, we fully understand that control legal migration is essential to the sustainability of the global economy. However, we strongly condemn the illegal people smugglers, the associated profiteers, and the misery they cause, loading people onto, onto clearly unsafe vessels and boats. The ultimate solution lies in addressing push, pushing factors and this is not in IMO's remit. Although IMO has been working with other bodies and agencies, including UNHCR, IOM, and UNODC, to promote a coordinated approach. In June 2017, the Maritime Safety Committee, is one of the organs of the uh, organization, had the opportunity to consider the proposal made by the International Chamber of Shipping to support further action by the organization, in parallel with other United Nations specialized agencies, to promote appropriate and effective action at the United Nations. According to the information provided by ICS, International Chamber of Shipping, and despite the welcome increase in government funded resources and the activity of non-governmental organization vessels, the number of merchant ships involved in rescue operation has remained relatively constant since 2015, and the average number of persons rescued by each uh, merchant ships remains over 110. In, to in 2016, a total of 381 merchant ships were diverted, and 121 ships were involved in the rescue of 13,800. 888 people. Of particular concern for the shipping industry is the upward trend in migrants reported dead or missing in 2015 and 16, which, based on current leading indicators, can be expected to continue into 2017 and beyond. Member states and international organizations affirmed at the committee their concern for the humanitarian situation and the loss of life and agreed that the way forward was to promote appropriate and effective action at the United Nations. The Maritime Safety Committee also encouraged member states and international organizations in consultative status to participate in the Global Compact on Migration. Finally, the Secretary General reiterated his sincere appreciation to member states that had been contributing to the rescue of migrants at sea using naval, military, and intelligence services. Thank you. Myanmar. Mr. Chen and Excellency, when we are discussing in a global combat on migration, we cannot advise an issue which is constantly undermines orderly and regular migration. From Myanmar's perspective, and that issue of people smuggling and human trafficking is directly and adversely affecting the combat we are discussing. We had had just uh, during 
The court of yesterday discussion that this issue is common to many regions in the world. Therefore, we should be thinking of sufficient policy, safeguards, and priorities to transform people smuggling and human trafficking. In addition to the effective implementation of ACST legal framework, the GCM, we are looking at should be taken into consideration of the following best practices. One, providing technical assisted and enhancing capacity building of sunny state for a legal, affordable, and safe channel of migration. Two, better cooperation and coordination among national content points of law enforcement agency in protection of the basic right of migrants in vulnerable situations, including domestic workers. And three, government less initiated to advocate migrants labor sending and using private sector in both sending transit and receiving state to protect the fundamental right of migrant workers in all time, including before departure during transit and at their workplace. Four, secure and fortify the contribution of NGOs to gain to assistance of migrants in vulnerable situations, including migrants workers in both sandy transit and receiving state. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Guatemala, followed by Sri Lanka. Muchas gracias, señor moderador. Consideramos que el Pacto Mundial es la oportunidad para propiciar las condiciones necesarias para que las personas puedan migrar de una forma segura, ordenada y regular. Debemos crear mecanismos que permitan a las personas no solo regularizar su situación migratoria, sino también integrarse de lleno a las sociedades de acogida. Asimismo, Si bien podemos discutir formas para enfrentar coordinadamente las consecuencias que se derivan de los grandes movimientos de migrantes y refugiados, no debemos perder la perspectiva de la necesidad urgente de atender no solo las consecuencias, sino las causas de tales movimientos migratorios. En ese sentido, insistir en la importancia de las asociaciones concretas y prácticas entre países de origen, tránsito y destino, así como organizaciones internacionales, humanitarias, de desarrollo y financieras, contando con la participación activa de la sociedad civil y las comunidades locales y las diásporas. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Sri Lanka. Mr. Chair, among several efforts to reduce vulnerabilities of migrants, the government of Sri Lanka had introduced a combating team named Anti-Human Trafficking Task Force. With the assistance of the Attorney General, Criminal Investigation Department, and with collaborations of IOM, ILO, and civil societies to protect the uh, victims of human trafficking and to trace and to catch the traffickers and sue them uh, before the law. And meantime, uh, they have introduced another pre-orientation programs especially to migrant workers. And there is a, another special matter. We have introduced Code of Ethical Conduct for Recruitment Agencies in Sri Lanka. Uh, though this has happened, but uh, incidentally, we are hearing unfortunate incident at the host countries about our employees. Without the control of the, the countries involved for these uh, recruitment specially. And I draw your kind attention, the attention of the IDM for these uh, incidents, unfortunate incidents, to eradicate unfortunate incidents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. Just uh, we raise our flag just to reiterate uh, what has been said by the and thank the, the speakers for what has been said. Um, and we hope that this has been already an agreed principle. The first one is one, um, in terms of coordination, we have already done this and it has been made proven to be doable that it should always be an interagency that involves national, regional, and local governments, as well as uh, includes uh, other stakeholders like the NGOs, the CSOs, and the academia. In terms of 
effective coordination. The second one is that um, I said that there is no inherent vulnerability of migrants. It is the situation that they are in that makes them vulnerable. And in that sense, uh, we do believe that it should be it should be highlighted again that there is no illegal migrant. It is it is their situation that makes them uh, in irregular situation. Third, um, the unilateral uh, protective measures uh, done by states, especially by countries of origin, should not and could not replace the measures that should be done, done by, for whatever reason, by, by host governments in pursue one to their human rights obligation to which they have agreed to do. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Last Colombia. Muy rápidamente. Es que a veces uno escucha comentarios y sigue escuchando comentarios que desconocen totalmente el fenómeno migratorio. Nosotros tenemos la tendencia de, de hacer distinciones y categorizar a los migrantes situándolos en varias categorías. Que el migrante económico, que el migrante eh, forzado, que el migrante voluntario. Y aunque muchas veces... Ese esfuerzo para categorizar y dado la complejidad precisamente del fenómeno migratorio, esa distinción no es posible hacerla en la práctica y de ahí precisamente el argumento de que todos los migrantes, sin importar su condición, tienen el mismo derecho a las leyes humanitarias. Y yo creo que el principal reto precisamente de este gran pacto que debemos negociar es aquella población de migrantes que tienen que dejar sus casas, sus hogares, y irse sin ningún tipo de planificación a otros lugares. Ahí es donde debe tener el mayor reto y el mayor compromiso este pacto global. Gracias. The last word on the panelist, to the panelist, uh, just uh, one minute, one minute, 30 seconds each, uh, starting with you, Mr. Joff uh, Rashi. Uh, your concluding remarks, please. Well, still... Uh Coordination at all level, it's, it's, it's really important because uh, uh, without the coordination, any kind of uh, ideas deriving from each end, global uh, or uh, national, and uh, they cannot be fulfilled because uh, someone can start uh, some good ideas and some good action, but the other cannot uh, proceed because there is no uh, coordination. However, uh, the compact, I think, will be one of the important uh, things there because it will somehow make an umbrella uh, for this kind of coordination and also reveal the problems which are on the on different levels in terms of uh, cooperation and coordination among international players. Thank you. Mr. Fall? I am encouraged by the fact that almost every positive and innovative idea we think about, there is one or more country in the world that is championing it and doing it. So my lesson from that is the compact, perhaps what we should aim for is for plurality of opportunities rather than trying to insist on sort of coherence. Because countries would be at different places, but we need to have a compact that allows different countries to try different things and for people to learn from each other. And linked to that is, for example, innovation on circular migration. I think there need to be new and renewed and innovative thinking about circular migration. From business point of view, we've been now talking about the possibility of job sharing so that the circular migrant who's in one country for six months perhaps have a counterpart in the country of origin so that when he or she returns to the country of origin, they're not returning just sitting there. They're returning productively engaged, knowing that they can go back. Job sharing is done very well in many economies within countries. Perhaps it is time to try it across borders as well. Thank you. Mr. Olivier. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I'm in agreement with the um, representative from the Philippines, uh, of course, as is clear from presentation. Let me make a remark or two about uh, the representative from Libya on the uh, irregular migrants. Uh, three short remarks. I think the world can really take notice of what is done in some ASEAN countries in terms of the regularizing the position of literally millions of migrant workers. 
Um, I invite you to consider this. A country like Thailand, for example, has done a magnificent job in this regard. Secondly, the issues that we have been discussing in my presentation on the extension of um, mechanisms by or measures by countries of origin, um, there is no reason in my view why, in principle, these measures cannot also, should not also cover undocumented and informal migrant workers. Um, there may be some practical challenges there. And thirdly, I would suggest that for the compact, it's actually crucial to take this issue on board as to what can countries of origin do, in fact, more than that, what could be expected of them to support in social protection terms their own migrant workers abroad. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the panelists. Uh, please join me in thanking them for... <laughs>